All right, so if you tuned in last week, we had part one of the path integration series. Now we are on to part two. I'm excited about this week. We are not quite finished with uh, quantum mechanics, but we will be introducing some, uh, we will be introducing some other formalisms like Fox space and time ordering and functionals. So if you're wondering what these things are, if you see them, you see the notation about functionals and time ordering and stuff like that, then today's a good day for you because this is the stuff that we're going to be talking about. Uh, but today, where we left off last week. All right. So there's two different formulations that we had last week. Two formulas that we ended with last week. Uh, again, if you missed last week's uh, lecture, or uh, the first part in this series, it's on my YouTube, kind of like cut and edited down a little bit, and it's just under an hour. So, And this will be probably around the same. Uh, and then I will cut this one down and edit it as well and get rid of some of the fluff that we have left over. But we had this where we had the sum uh, over all the paths of Q uh, times the exponent of uh, what we had as, and well, I think Admiral Entropy had, right? Maybe not, maybe maybe so, I can't remember, but uh, the, uh, the action uh, is the, in this integral, in the exponent, okay. And uh, we had this formulation. The other formulation we had was a little bit lengthier, but it included the momentum. And if you remember right, the way that we got rid of the momentum was uh, by um, using our classical mechanical equations uh, and solving for uh, P, which we were able to do using, uh, it's the standard way to get from the Hamiltonian to the Lagrangian. And then the symbol, if you're unfamiliar with it, again, we talked about it last week, but I'll refresh your memory. This symbol just means the integral over all of the paths. So we're just, it basically one way you can think of it is we're counting all of the possible paths that we're doing when we do this integral. Uh, we want to make sure that each path has some sort of contribution. And then that contribution is what we're going to uh, ultimately be solving when we get into, uh, when we get into the quantum field theory, we'll be solving the contribution of each possible path. And then the, today, the interesting thing about today is the path is gonna be a little bit different than we had last week. So uh, again, these were the two formalisms. We had the, uh, and this is what we ended with last week. Okay, so these were the two formulations we had uh, where we had one with the momentum and one without. The one without the momentum is obviously more uh, desirable, uh, but the momentum still comes in handy. So we still have that formalism a little bit. Uh, so what do we do now? Well, let's start with some sort of example, I think, where we can sort of take a look at this and we'll see, we'll get through most of the example today. But um, let's consider just a position, right? So let's consider, so consider a position. Whoops, that's a, po a position, a position, a poisson before NC yells at me. Consider a position I probably said it wrong again. <laughs> um, where we have the operator of Q at some time, T1. And if you remember, we, we have, like this, what this really means is we have some, you know, some space here, we'll call this Q prime, some spot here in space, Q double prime. And then there's like every possible path to get from Q prime to Q double prime. And this integral is integrating over all possible paths. Okay. Uh, and we don't really know what's going on in the middle, but we want to just integrate over all of them so all of them are accounted for. <clears throat> to save them, <laughs> boys, addition. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, and then, so what? How do we go about finding this position, or how do we go about incorporating in this? And we can again sandwich it in between the middle of our. Uh, in the middle of our two points so we can sort of figure out what's going on. I'm going to start dropping the hats just because I don't want to write them over and over again. Um, so if anybody is unclear about when we go from operators, uh, quantum operators to classical things, it's pretty much uh, lowercase that's not inside of a state is classical. That's pretty much the idea. Um, so then we can go ahead and do what we did before and bring out this minus i h uh, T double prime minus T, where this is, takes care of the time component in the states, if you guys remember that from last week. And uh, and that is going to be basically How evolving. How dare you it. drop the hats? Good day, <laughs> sir. <laughs> They're gone. 
uh, this is t1, not, uh, not t, sorry, t1. And then this is going to be t1 minus t prime. And again, this is just applying it to like what we might consider the time evolution operator. Or uh, is that right? Time evolution operator? Yeah, time evolution. Today we're doing the time ordering operator, which is different. But this is like the time evolution process, where we take that time state and we get it out of a state form and into an exponential. Um, something you might learn in quantum mechanics. One, if you uh, are used to that. Um, okay, now uh, from here, we can you know say of course that QT1 is an eigenvalue, just like we had last week of Q. So we'll just say, uh, and then that means that uh, we can go ahead and get something that looks like this. Uh, Q double prime, T double prime, Q of T1, Q, prime t prime is equal to and then the integral of dp dq e to the i and then the action because remember i said this is all just the action okay um you know of course where you know where s is equal to um you know the integral from t prime to t double prime dt of p q dot minus Hamiltonian, okay? <clears throat> Alrighty, now where do we go from here? Well, let's consider two points, okay? So this is just gonna be finding one thing, so let's just, you know, you can pick some random time in between t double prime and t prime, t prime being the initial point and t double prime being the final point, right? And we can just pick some part in the middle and this is qt1. Well, what if we have two, right? So what if we have qt1 and qt2? <laughs> QD1 and QD2. QD1 and QD2. Okay. Uh, this will, of course, lead to pretty much the same expression. The integral of dp, dq, e, uh, and then we'll have... Oh, did I drop something? I think I dropped something from that first one. Ooh, I did, didn't I? I did. I missed the actual eigenvalue. <laughs> Little important e to the i s. There we go. Uh, because this one has the same thing, right? This one has the same eigenvalues, except now we have a qd1 and a qd2. Uh, qd1 and a qd2. qd2. And then, of course, e to the i s. Okay. Uh, did you leave a q out of that integral? Oh, good catch, Admiral. Good, good catch. Nice. Well done. should look at chat more often. Um, alrighty. So what's next? Uh, but we don't really know the order of the T1 and T2. And I think this is where we're going to start dealing with the time ordering. Before I just said, hey, pick one. This is QD1, right? QT1, it doesn't really matter because it's just in between T prime and T, T double prime and T prime, right? But now what happens if we have two points? Well, it matters if one's here versus one's here. Why? Because that depends on the path that you're going. Like it's, I mean, like it's not <laughs> impossible to make some arbitrarily dumb path, right? Um, but you could, nevertheless, we want to have a more uh, adequate way to handle what is going on here. So let's think about this uh, more carefully. And let's introduce what we call the time ordering, which will have a significance. Is T2, T1 less than T2? Or is uh, T2 less than T1? And that's what we kind of need to get a, hang of, a, hand, a handle of. So we're gonna introduce what's called the time ordering operator and this will help us define one of these to be the, uh, the one that we carry that calculation out. And then from there on, it doesn't really matter what, which one we choose to define it, but that's just like a, we're setting a convention. And this operator is the thing that sets the convention. Okay? So let's get a handle on that operator. So I'm going to erase this stuff. I don't think I will need it right away. But let me introduce the operator. And what we're going to use is called a step function. Um, it's similar to the Dirac delta, uh, but it basically just means uh, you satisfy. Uh, it's like the Dirac delta function, except instead, uh, instead it's. I don't know what it is exactly. Oh, it's kind of like uh, like you'll just be able to define it with the variable t. Uh, so if it follows one of them, 
you know, if, it, if we define t1 to be less than t2, then one of these is zero. If we define t2 to be less than t1, the other one is zero. So let's define that right now. So let's say we have our q prime, double prime, excuse me, t double prime, and then we have our time ordering operator acting on our qd1 and our qd2. And now again, this is going to tell us which order we have to consider and how do we, uh, how do we know what that is? Well, let's have it, e let's have it equal to both of them. Okay. So we'll have some step function here. Uh, maybe somebody could look up a more concrete definition of step function, but basically if T, uh, T one is less than T two is raising to his hand. Chat is raising to his hand. Equal Dirac delta. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dirac delta function is the derivative of the step function. Yeah, so it's it, it looks acts like pretty, a step. It, it does look like a step, but it is the same. It has the same concept, right? If it, if the the, the uh, you know if t one is less than t two, then this is not zero. This is one. If t two is less than t one, then this is zero. Uh, and then we'll have one for the other side of it as well. So we have q double prime, t double prime. And then what survives, well, like I said, this will be one if T1 is less than T2. And uh, I think that's right. Uh, Sometimes called heavy side function. Heavy side function. Ah, very good. Very, very good. Um, heavy side, yeah, heavy side step function. That's the guy that came up with it, too. That was his name, right? Uh, heavy side. Uh, Pat, welcome to the channel. Uh, Pat Tillman, welcome to the channel. If you have any questions, exclamation mark, ask, and I will get to them. Uh, right now, we're kind of in the middle of a path integration lesson um, for Twitch chat. Uh, so there's the first one, and then we have another heavy side step function. Very good. I love that heavy side step function. Uh, and then, it's, like I said, the, uh, the ordering matters. One of these will be zero, one of these will be one, and they will never both be one or zero. Uh, and then the ordering, of course, will change. And that's, and if we know, we've done this plenty of times on, you know, this channel, that the ordering for operators really matters, right? Like, ordering can really change quite a bit. Um, so here we go. There we have QT1 and QT2, and here we have QT2 and QT1. So whichever one is greater will result in you know, so obviously if T2 is greater than T1, then we'll want T1 to act on this position first and then T2 to act on the position second. Uh, though pedantically, uh, the heavy side and other step functions is different. One is def defined at zero and the other not. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, interesting way to think about it, for sure. Uh, so now we're gonna have to introduce another trick uh, so I'm going to do both these tricks back to back. Hope you guys are good with that. Uh, but it's just setting stuff up for next week, basically, uh, as we switch from quantum uh, mechanics to quantum field theory. Uh, so here's the time ordering operator. So here we have time ordering, time ordering. And next up is going to be the functional derivative. Now, does anyone know what a functional derivative is while well, I start writing some stuff down? Um, actually, we're going to start about right now, but you can think of a discrete derivative or the classical, the derivative that you're kind of used to as being written as the following, right? You're going to take some partial derivative of some variable x sub i, and you're going to act on x sub j. And what's that going to give you? Well, it will give you a Dirac delta of i j, right? Uh, a Kronecker delta, right? Because if i and j are equal, then the derivative of this is the same thing as writing dx dx, right? Which equals 1. But if they're not, say, you know, apply a different variable. Say, let's do dy dx. Well, that's, what's dy dx in this situation when x is, when y is not a function of x? Well, that's zero, right? But this is just a discrete definition. We need something different. Maybe I should have done x1 and, and x2 or something like that to, to be a little bit more clear. But this is pretty much a definition of, of derivatives that we're used to using. This is discrete. But we're going to need a, uh, a continuous, several mathematicians are typing. <laughs> it's like the gradient of an infinite di uh, ve dimensional vector space. Yeah, exactly. Um, and maybe more, uh, more down to earth, people could think of it as just a, uh, people could think of it as just a, uh, a derivative of a continuous function. Uh, and some people, you know, it's easier to do this. I don't know what the exact wording is, but this is usually done in the vector space. Uh, 
but for we won't get into vector spaces too much. We'll just talk about it as a, a derivative of a function. So we have t1. So if we're taking the derivative with respect to, to the function of t1, and we take it, uh, yeah, okay, and we do a, a function of t2, then it's just going to be equal to the Dirac delta function of t1 minus t2, or t2 minus t1, excuse me. And, oh no, it is t1 minus t2. Mobby. And this is your standard Dirac delta that we've talked about several times before. Um, next up, uh, so that's the Dirac delta function, right? Now, uh, so now we have to think about, well, what are we gonna actually use these for? And I think I wanna erase, because I think I want the next one to be kind of fluid. Uh, we have a lot of writing to do. And then we're probably over halfway there after we're done with this writing. So we are making really, really good time. Um, more time for questions and, and voltage stuff. Much like vectors are tensors and tensors are vectors. Functions are vectors sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Very, very well, very well said, NC. Uh, so I do want to erase this, but we have our now our new thing. So time ordering is the, is the operator that controls which time uh, we're defining to be after the other time. And then the functional derivative is going to be, oh, I should write derivative, huh? Derivative is going to be the derivative based of a function. And instead of a discrete thing, we want something to be continuous. And this is going to be very, uh, very helpful in the next continuous. Hold, I see some, th I hear some things I want to. See what's going on. Give me just a second. Uh, continuous. Okay. What do we have here? Uh, Arbitron. Arbitrando Muser. Thank you for the follow. Welcome. And Hermetics. Thank you for the follow. Welcome on in, everybody. Uh, Hilbert space dual interpretation is what I was getting at. Start over, but this time with a compass and straight edge and derive everything from scratch. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome if you're just walking in now. This is part two of a path integration series I'm doing for Twitch chat uh, at their request and it's certainly a good practice for me. Um, part one is on my YouTube channel and uh, we are, we have about another 45 minutes of this or so and then we're gonna do some other stuff with some fun voltage things and uh, talk about some metaphysics and time and philosophy. So uh, feel free to stick around, ask questions with exclamation mark ask and they will go into a separate queue that I can get to them in a little bit. All right, so uh, now let's get rid of this. We have our two tools that we just introduced. Oh, my cord. Um, we have our two tools that we just introduced, and now we're going to go and apply them uh, in the following way, at least the functional derivative. Do we apply time ordering yet? No, we're gonna hang on to time ordering for a little bit. We'll see it towards, we'll see it in a little bit too. Um, but now what we need to do is need to modify the Lagrangian of the theory by introducing terms to the Hamiltonian. Okay, so what are these things? And remember when I said the whole uh, kerfuffle last week about whether or not it was an interacting theory uh, or a free theory, excuse me. And what we need to do is have some way to handle interacting terms, right? So what we're going to do is because I said it was a free, but what I meant really by free, it's not free because it has a potential, but what I meant by free was we can introduce some interacting terms to it. And so now it is interacting. And how do these look? Well. For our reference, let's just call one f of t, and we're gonna multiply that by cutie, and then we'll do h of t, and we'll multiply that by the momentum of time, okay? Uh, and then what do these things do for us? Well, we can define these to be just specified functions. So f and h are just gonna be, f and h are just specific functions. Functions that are going to be causing whatever we want for our Hamiltonian to be more general, right? We're gonna assume that something is interacting with our Hamiltonian and, and causing some chaos and we need to have some general way to handle that. So let's take a look at uh, what that means for us and it's really the same thing as before. We're gonna call this, uh, we'll call this H prime. There we go. So that way I don't have to write it again. Um, so we're gonna call that H prime. And then what we will do is go ahead and write out what we think our amplitude is going to be. So Q double prime, T double prime, um, and Q prime, T prime, uh, gonna be F and H, and then we'll get the <coughs> integral of DP, DQ, integral over all of the paths for both Q, and oh, what am I doing? What am I doing, what am I doing, what am I doing? I think I skipped down a step. I did, EXP of I, oops, 
That's supposed to be an integral, not an F. F's in chat for me. Um, and this is going to be, and this is T prime and T double prime and DT and P Q dot minus H plus, thank you, honey, F Q and H Q or H P, excuse me, plus F Q and H P. Are we good? F. <laughs> I you say F. F for fluorine. There we go. Um, <laughs> thank you for adding that, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, spoken, or that, uh, entropy, or that entropy command. I like that a lot. Okay. <clears throat> now, where are we at? So F and H, like I said, are specified functions, and we can kind of yeah, control no. what they do, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and we can control what they do. And what this functional derivative is going to do is it's going to let us kind of, we're going to do something that might feel a little bit weird, right? Um, but bear with me, and I'll explain why as I'm writing this down, okay? And what we'll do is we'll take the derivative 1 over i, and we'll take, we'll start using our functional derivative on f, okay? We'll do it first, right? And what will happen is we'll get, uh, we'll get the amplitude again. Uh, Q prime, T prime, and since this is all exponentials, right? This is kind of convenient because we'll always get, when we take the derivative of the exponential, you always get the exponential back. But now we'll get a term out in front, and what will that term be? Well, we'll get the integral of dP, dQ, and uh, then we'll get an actual eigenvalue, and it's our QD1. It's our, uh, our classical eigenvalue, QD1. And then we'll end up with this E and we'll get the same thing back. So we'll get the uh, DT uh, of, you know, the P Q dot minus the new Hamiltonian prime. Okay? I don't think I made any mistakes, but speak up if you see anything. Uh, <clears throat> here's... here's <laughs> I was talking to my wife. <laughs> okay, so then what do we do with the second one? And now I'm going to uh, kind of iterate what's going on with this, right? We have, now we have the functional of T1, but let's take another one. Let's take, again, another one over I and take another uh, functional derivative of F of T2. Now, why would I do this? Well, if this is a specified function, we can specify in a way to invoke something in quantum mechanics that we use very much, uh, what is that method in quantum mechanics that we use very much that might be helpful, QD1, QD2, uh, by taking multiple derivatives? What can we do with that? DT, oops, <laughs> it's not the delta T. It's not the functional derivative of time in the integral. It's just the normal one. DT. P Q dot minus H prime. Um, correlation function. Nope, close though. It is going to be the uh, perturbation, right? We're going to take multiple derivatives of this, and when we do, what we are going to end up seeing in quantum field theory, and I'm just going to kind of explain a little bit of the motivation behind this method. What we have in, in, quant in quantum field theory is we have coupling constants. This sort of kind of dictate how much um, how much something is going to couple or how much something is going to interact or just do something, right? So like the charge of the electron is a coupling constant in QED because it actually dictates, you know, how probable it is for something to interact. So uh, how probable it is for an electron to interact. And we talked about that on Sunday when we started talking about lightning and plasma and all this other stuff. Like these are all can be done in quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics by using coupling constants, right? So what we'll have here is these are going to be very specific in quantum field theory. In QFT, we're going to call these sources. And in the sources, we'll have coupling constants. And the coupling constants, after you start taking the derivative, you're going to get them to be part of this QT, right? And what happens if we have lambda? And lambda is really small. So you know the charge of an electron is really small, right? So if lambda is really small, um, you know, if lambda is really small, then how small is lambda squared? How small is lambda to the third? 
I mean, every time you square it or do the third, it's gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller until the point where we can sign to say like, okay, after we get to two, these are too small, we don't care anymore. Um, so then, these are gonna serve a very certain purpose in quantum field theory. So right now, we're gonna use the functional derivative to get these coupling constants down. And then once we have so many of them, we realize that uh, we're not contributing to the probability that we're gonna have a certain path anymore. Okay? Uh, feel free to ask questions if that didn't make any sense. Uh, and then next up, we have, uh, next up we have, uh, we can do the same thing with H. I was gonna write it out, but I don't think it matters because it's literally the same thing. Uh, here we have, you know, one over I, D, D, H of T, and then we'll have this, and then we'll have D, P, D, Q, and then P of T instead of Q of T. But, so the same thing works for the, the momentums. We don't need to see it written down. Uh, but then after we bring down enough terms, then we can say, then we can set our terms equal to, then we can set our functions equal to zero, right? We're gonna say that these are gonna equal zero and that now we can get rid of them from the Hamiltonian. Uh, so how do we have this work practically, right? Again, our sources are gonna be something that are very reliant on the coupling constants. So after a certain term, after we get enough of these down, we can set the rest to zero because it's not gonna matter anymore. Um, so what portion of this is gonna be uh, well, how do we write it down like more practically? And this is going to be um, where we, I wanted to end the board. So this is great that we actually made it here. Uh, we're not quite done with the lesson yet, so don't don't go anywhere. I wonder if I can just keep going and finish the thing for, straight from the book because we're making great time. Um, oh, but then again, I have a lot of material for today too. So Q double prime, T double prime. Uh, and now this is where we're going to introduce our time ordering operator. We don't have a huge practical need for it right now. QD1 uh, all the way up to uh, PTN. Is this supposed to be QT? I think it's supposed to be PTN or QT1. Maybe I should double check that. I think I might have a, a error in my notes. I got to double check really quick. Um, but it, we don't have like a, 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 this doesn't have like a super pragmatic use most of the time. It's not like something where, I should say it has a very pragmatic use. It doesn't have a calculatable use, right? It's going to be a de definition. So by defining these to be a certain way, we get T. So we're not going to really like look at that where we have like every single heavy side step function like listed out and then just like start setting them all equal to zero. We'll just dictate something and this will tell us to keep them in the right order. Uh, I have to check a uh, I have to check a subscript really quick. I don't want to give you guys the wrong subscripts, and uh, I don't have to go very far to find it. It is T1 and then TN. Okay, cool. I do have the right subscripts. Okay, is my chair in the way? No, my chair will not be in the way either. Hi, Bunny Space Lover. Welcome. Um. Okay, so the uh. So again, if you understand perturbation, you understand why we're doing this, right? This is a method to sort of get the only the relevant terms out as we're going to see them arise, okay? Um, oh, and then, so what is this time ordering equal to? Well, it's going to be equal to the following. One over, uh, one over I, uh, one over I times, you know, the, the, uh, the functional derivative of F of T of one. Man, I can't write down here. F of T1, uh, you know, all the way up until we get to the functional derivative now of, of H of Tn, right? Because we want the H's to act with the P's and the, the F's to act with the Q's because that's the way we defined our Hamiltonian. Um, and then we're gonna have all of this act on the amplitude. So we're gonna go from sandwiching this, right? into some eigenvalue attached to the amplitude of Q double prime, T double prime. I don't mean eigenvalue, I mean, well, maybe I mean not eigenvalue, but it'll be some constant in front of eigenvalue, and this will be our uh, probability that something is gonna act. F of H, which is equal to zero, so we're gonna set F of H to equal to zero once we have enough terms to make sure that the perturbation is complete. Can you guys see the bottom? Yeah, this just says F equals H equals zero if you're having trouble seeing that. Um, 
Uh, so I have an in a video where we did an introduction uh, to um, quantum field theory, where we go, where we, we are working fully in Fox space. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, you can check the YouTube for the introduction to uh, quantum field theory video, and you'll see the uh, the the where I outline Fox space. Um, it's not a high voltage package, no. <laughs> um, not yet. Um, Fox Space is where I go when I realize I messed up a step in the beginning of every problem. <laughs> um, so Fox Space is basically, let me just give you a quick rundown if you don't know it. We, Fox Space is a place where like the where we talk about occupation, right? So you can have a, like a bunch of zeros to multi, to, uh, for a bunch of states. And this is just like occupation of, of particles, right? So this would be like, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can talk about six different particles all in one state, okay? And that state is that there's zero of them. There's no particles, okay? But then we can introduce like, uh, you know, we can have a creation operator where we have a dagger one. It's a step, right? If you know the step, uh, the step operators, the step up and step down. And basically what this does is it creates a particle in the one space. Right? So now our new state is like so, where it's one, zero, 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 and that means that we have one particle. Okay, so usually we can simplify this by just writing a dagger and talking about one particle, you know? So a dagger acting on one would be in there's two, right? And it's just an occupation, right? And then there's usually some uh, eigenvalue out here that has to do with what number you're acting on. Uh, and this is what we call Fox space, right? It's not like a real space. It's not like something that we can move around in, but it's something that we can talk about. It's, we're talking about it now, right? It's whether or not there exists a particle and how many particles exist in a certain uh, energy state and, <coughs> and whatnot. Um, uh, but instead, before, like I said, we started in one spot in Q prime, we ended in another spot, Q double prime, and then the paths to get from one to the other were important, right? But now we can consider a different type of path. There where... can only be one. No, that's not true. <laughs> not true at all. Imagine how fast octopuses would write on a chalkboard. I think that'd be impressive. And I bet you they could too. Uh, um, my pleasure. Okay, now, uh, so what does this mean? So now instead of saying, okay, we're gonna go from one space, you know, in space, one spot in space to another spot in space, let's go from one representative state to another representative state, and we'll call both of those the ground state. Okay, so we're gonna say, what is the op what's the probability that we're gonna start in a ground state and we're gonna end in a ground state? And whatever happens in the middle is allowed to happen. Like you can create particles, you can annihilate particles, you can do whatever you want in the middle. Um, but you have to, uh, but we don't know what it is, right? So we're gonna say now the, the beginning position, the beginning spot in our path integration and the end spot is just gonna be a state where there's no particles, okay? The ground state. Uh, and we'll say that this is, we're gonna subject it to our weird for functions, f and h, and we're gonna take the limit as t prime goes to uh, negative infinity, and as t double prime goes to positive infinity. Why don't I cover every single possibility, okay? So we'll have the integral of um, d q double prime, d q prime, and then we'll have our wave function. Now, uh, I didn't introduce this, so I'll have to introduce it in just a second. But uh, if you're familiar with quantum mechanics, then you know what the wave function is. Uh, but let me just write it down really quick for those who don't, especially in Fox space, it might be a little weird. I do know that a lot of people don't see Fox space in quantum mechanics, and if they do, it's kind of like brushed over kind of quickly. Uh, Fox space is much more a quantum field theory uh, space to live in. Um, and we have, a, we have to define the ground state wave function. The ground state wave function is just gonna be psi of zero uh, of Q, and of course, if you remember right, it's just going to be taking our Q state, the inner product of our Q state with the ground state, okay? You did like this color? Speak potato. <laughs> um, I do have the speakers for subs um, as a means to just, because in case people show up who I don't know and I can't keep a track of chat and stuff like that, it's just a, one more line of defense to stop against um, trolls. Oh, I see. I like it. I spelled color wrong. <laughs> I get it. Well done. I'm impressed. Well done. Uh, I want to say you can combine Hilbert spaces with the tensor product, but I wasn't certain. 
Um, yeah, definitely. I think you can. Uh, the, maybe there's rules about which ones you can, but you certainly can. You kind of have to for quantum mechanics, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Um, but I'm, there might be rules to what kind of Hilbert spaces you can tensor together. Obviously there is, right? But if they're all the same to Hilbert space you kind. from people like me, good day, sir. <laughs> Some like, um, oh, <laughs> hello again. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we have to invoke another trick, okay? Uh, and this trick is going to uh, kind of get us out of this issue that we have with, uh, or kind of like maybe express to us a little bit about how we're going to deal with Q's and, and, and Fox space, right? So let's say we have the state Q prime T prime, okay? We're going to set that equal to, and again, we're going to do the same trick, that, or the same thing that we did last week where we have the E, uh, the, the, um, e to the I H T of Q prime. And, uh, okay, you're not okay? I'm just saying hello again. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> let's keep going with this. And so we're going to do the same thing where we have E to the I H uh, T and, uh, and now we're going to do, we're going to insert a completeness relation, right? We had one of those last week where we did the integral, but now we're going to do the sum over all of the possible states where N is going to be the number of particles in that state. So we'll have E to, e to the I H T and then we're going to insert our states N m right and we're going to sum over all of those so if you sum over all of those states that's just one and now we're allowed to bring that in and then we're going to see this is something that you guys do a lot in quantum mechanics so uh so you guys have probably seen this trick quite a bit before but now we're going to have this n inner product between this n and this q prime and we're going to see what happens with that right well that of course uh if you have some particles in some position then you're going to get n equals zero infinity e to the uh, i, and now the Hamiltonian is going to act on the nth state, which means we're going to talk about the energy eigenvalue of the nth state, right? Uh, and this is one of those things where you can tailor series this out, apply h to n, you'll see that you'll get the x, you'll get the energy eigenvalue, and then you can put it back to the expect no expectation, the exponential by undoing the Taylor series. And uh, then we'll also have our uh, we'll have our eigenfunction, uh, which is going to be psi sub n of q prime, which is just this. You know, this is our notation right here, so this is the same thing. And, uh, and then we're going to have our last state n, because even though we apply the operator h to it, it doesn't make the state go to zero. It's still a state, or one, that is. Um, <laughs> boring math, professor. <laughs> I had a joke about, um, about, you know, I work a lot in Fox space, right? So I had a joke about doing like a series on Fox space and calling it Fox, uh, university or, uh, shorter version of that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> where of course, like I said, this is just going to equal a version of this where we have N and Q here. Um, and uh, what do we do with this? Uh, well, now we're going to do another little trick, okay? Now we're going to make another, uh, another little adjustment. We're going to send h, and we're going to adjust it in the following way. 1 minus i epsilon times h, where epsilon, you can imagine, is some incredibly, incredibly tiny, tiny number. Sorry, my chords are overlapping today a lot. Um, I apologize. Um, what do we got? If a squirrel looked inside uh, from his window, it would have dire consequences for humanity. <laughs> there probably is squirrels looking in my windows right now. Um, they always watch. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, yeah, so we, we call this epsilon a small uh, positive infinitesimal, so it's almost zero. Okay, and we can take the limit. So now we're going to take the limit. So we can take the limit. Take the limit for the fourth time in a row of um, t prime going to negative infinity. That was what we had originally established we wanted to do. So we're going to take the limit as t prime goes to uh, negative infinity. And uh, this eliminates every state except the following. The ground state 
um, of Q prime acting on the ground state, okay? Which is really nice for us because that's really all we want, okay? Uh, and then what we can do, and that's, like I said, that's helpful because we really want the ground state acting on the ground state and doing this, we can get back up to here, right? We, we see this right here. We want this inside of here. And if we take the limit, then we can easily get back to there. Uh, so it is a trick to get around from spot to spot. And then we'll do this and take the limit as we said, and then everything goes away except the ground state, which is really good. Again, it's kind of like a, pertur a perturbative uh, situation. We can then, uh, multiply some arbitrary function again kind of like the same thing we were doing before um so we're gonna uh multiply by some arbitrary function i probably won't write this step down it's pretty much the same thing that we were doing before with the s and h if we multiply by some arbitrary function and then we integrate over q prime uh we can end up getting rid of this and we'll end up with just some constant times the ground state and why is that good well that's good because if we integrate over, by the way, if we integrate over Q prime, then we'll end up getting Q prime in the integral. We'll get another completeness relation, and that's where we get the constant from. Up of electric, thank you for following. Uh, I really appreciate that, and welcome to the channel. Um, so again, if we multiply by some arbitrary function, like our F or our H, that's how we're able to get out of this and into some constant times the ground state. Uh, so we can do the same type of analysis. So now we do the same thing, same thing with the other side, which is, um, let me write it down, which is going to be the, the bra version. Uh, oops. Q double prime T double prime equals Q double prime E to the negative I H T. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. That's just the original step that starts here. And then we'll do the same process. We'll do the all the way through. We'll multiply by some arbitrary function. We'll get rid of this uh, eigenfunction and we'll get a constant times zero. And, uh, <clears throat> and this gives us our final equation. We're finishing up for the day. We're making great time. Um, and this gives our final equation, which we're going to revisit next week. And it looks like this. All right, at the very bottom. And I don't think my chair is in the way, so. And it will look like this. So now we're at, we're wanting to find from the ground state to the ground state, that's gonna be our new path. Uh, and again, we're gonna allow a bunch of stuff to happen in the middle, but we actually don't even have that much left, right? We have this integral over all of the paths in momentum, integral over all the paths in position, times some exponential, times i, times the integral from negative infinity now to positive infinity. Remember, we have taken the limits. We've set negative or set t prime to negative infinity. We set t to infinity. We want to really count everything that could happen between the ground state and the ground state. And then, like I said, from here, we'll get some amplitude of probability that actual particles will start creating or annihilating in this Fox space that we're dealing with. H, let me write down this last equation and we'll be all set. F of Q plus H P, not F of Q, F times Q and H times P. And uh, that's it. And we've done it. Uh, can you read that? You can read that. Uh, and I mean, like I said, that's where we're at. We have, uh, we will be stopping here today. I don't think I can go without doing notes. I'd rather not anyways. Uh, there's not much left to the chapter, um, but I don't want to just write down the next couple equations. Can we do it really quickly? No, because now we have to apply perturbation theory. Um, so I'll wait until we get to next week. I kind of thought this would take longer, but we didn't have any questions this time, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit surprising because last week we had a lot of questions. So either uh, this is a lot more harder to understand <laughs> or... Uh, Maybe I did a better job. <laughs>